Let's do this. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening, depending on the time zone you're in. My name is Max Frass, and if we've not met before in, in this space, I'm CFC facilitator, and it's a great pleasure for me to announce this first CFC brainstorm and first challenge of 2022. Um, I will offer a few words of introduction on the, the format of the event or the events, because uh, I guess some of you might be new to brainstorms. So a big welcome to those of you new to the community and new to the format of the brainstorms and challenges in general. And then I will tell you what the, is it that we will be doing in this particular event. So as I said, this is the first uh, brainstorm event of 2022 and the first brainstorm challenge of, um, of uh, sorry, first challenge, the CFC challenge of 2022. Um, as you know, we are focusing on COVID-19 health impacts and this brainstorm will be focusing on some aspects of that. But as some of you, especially with knowledge of previous challenges know, we've slightly adapted the format and we're gonna have this brainstorm now and then another one on the 2nd of March and you can already register for that. And this will be looking more at the socioeconomic uh, aspects of um, COVID's in, impact and the link will be shared with you and you'll, you'll be able to register for that as well and then we'll have a policy maker um, event at the end of March and this is uh, this, those are the main build, building blocks of our challenge cycle so the brainstorms are there for us to stimulate ideas to hear from formidable experts from Chatham House and elsewhere on the core topic on in this case different aspects of it so a little bit a little different this this time and a little different on the 2nd of March and then we will be building up to a meeting with policymakers by sharing ideas and, and solutions to problems identified during brainstorms. We will be doing this on the platform, also partly during the, um, the webinars themselves, to the, the brainstorming events. And then we will conclude in a policymaker meeting at the end of March. We don't have dates for that yet, because um, we're still agreeing on the list of policymakers that will be joining us. So a few technicalities about this particular meeting. We hope that you can be with us for another hour and 10 minutes. Um, the session is being recorded and that we would very much like to encourage you to actively participate in this by, uh, by listening to our speakers first, of course, but then also participating in the Q&A and then in a, in a small um, group discussion on the topics that were raised. So the format, and I'll drop it in, the, in our chat later once our speakers um, come in, is we're going to have a, a short introduction obviously that's happening now and we will have um, a set of well, two presentations opening remarks from our guest speakers and allow me to welcome our guest speakers we have two uh, chatham house um, fellows with us today today jessica hamer who is a research fellow and specializes in universal health coverage on the global health uh, program at chatham house and there we have karishma kurup who's a research fellow specializing in health security and also part of the global health program at Chatham House. So Jessica and Karishma, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, just to go through the, the, the format of the meeting. So after about a 10 minute presentation by each of our guest speakers, we're going to have 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, the way we go about this, we normally encourage you to take the floor and ask the questions yourselves. If you can yeah, use your camera and your mic, that's great. Um, so yeah, you can raise your hand and then I'll, I'll give you the floor. If for some reason you cannot do this, you can also drop your question in the chat and then also I can ask it on your um, behalf. So we have about 15 minutes for Q&A and then we have the engage phase of the, of the event, which is about half an hour, maybe a bit less depending on the time frame, um, for you to work in smaller groups, uh, reflecting, feeding back on, on what you've heard and, and interacting with other community members, and then we'll meet for a quick wrap up. So we're looking at uh, a quarter past six GMT finish today. Okay, I'm out of breath, which means I'm probably at the end of the announcements for today. So again, thank you very much for joining us. If there's anything else that you want to ask in terms of the format of the meeting, um, then please uh, ask me or Fiona. And by the way, Fiona is, is, is spinning the plates here in, in terms of technical facilitation. Um, so yeah, any questions that you got on the on the event or any problems you got with the connection, please either contact me or Fiona. So without much further ado, uh, allow me to introduce Jessica Hamer, who will be the first to take the floor today. Jessica, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Max, and uh, very nice to be here, and thanks for uh, inviting me along to this conversation. Um, so we were asked today to share a few reflections on what COVID has revealed about health systems 
and also what options there are for creating more resilient and stable health systems emerging from the pandemic. So to start with the first question, in terms of what COVID has revealed about health systems, um, I think it's, it's probably pretty obvious to all of you um, that it's really revealed weaknesses and weaknesses in health systems worldwide across the board and across countries at all income levels, although often these have played out in very different ways in, in different contexts. But undoubtedly, COVID has been a big challenge in many places. Um, so I wanted to, to talk a little bit about what COVID revealed about progress towards universal health coverage, which, uh, as Max mentioned, that's my focus area, uh, and which is all about strong health systems, which can effectively meet people's healthcare needs. Um, so universal health coverage means all people having access to the healthcare they need, when they need it, without suffering financial hardship. And this is a goal that the whole world has signed up to achieving by 2030, uh, through the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and universal health coverage, or UHC, is often thought about as expanding um, health coverage across three dimensions. So services, so you know, can you access the full range of health services you need, or are there some that you can't get access to? Um, population, so is everybody accessing these services, uh, or are some people unable to? Um, and then a third dimension, which is about protection from financial risk. Um, so that means stopping people paying for their health care out of pocket. Um, so it requires some form of prepayment like taxation. So how did countries perform against those three pillars during a, a time of COVID and how did their health systems perform? So on services, uh, Karishma will say more on public health and preparedness gaps, but we saw many failures on access to services in the pandemic, as I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, shortages of intensive care beds, ventilators, oxygen. We saw facilities overwhelmed in many different contexts at times. So if you look at Hong Kong today, that's facilities are, are currently um, uh, being overwhelmed, if you think of India during the second wave, um, many, many different contexts uh, faced um, their healthcare facilities being overrun. Um, there were, we saw gaps in terms of rural areas, uh, uh, which may have had long standing issues of not having access to healthcare facing the pandemic with that situation. Um, testing was limited in many different contexts. And then we had huge disruption of existing health services. So routine immunization, HIV and TB treatment, cancer treatment, uh, supported uh, pregnancy and assisted births. Um, and even in high income countries, there was massive disruption in these services. So um, cancer in particular, and what they call elective surgery. Um, I think I was reading the other day, almost 6 million people in the UK are currently on a waiting list for some sort of healthcare procedure, which is about 8% of the population. So that's in how, how uh, health systems were affected in terms of services. In terms of population, there were real challenges reaching marginalised groups, which came to the fore. So, for example, uh, ensuring migrants were able to get access to COVID treatment prisoners. Um, and as I mentioned, that kind of division between rural and urban populations came out in many places too. And then on this third dimension of financial risk protection. Um, so we really saw a lot of countries where COVID testing, treatment and vaccines uh, required payment from people um, out of pocket. Uh, and in some places that saw those um, costs really going through the roof uh, and becoming what what is termed catastrophic health costs. So that's really where costs take up so much of your income uh, that you are selling off your assets, you're going into significant debt to pay for your health care. And we saw that a lot. And again, um, the second wave in, in India's pandemic really springs to mind on that front. So the second question I was asked to address was really what options are there for creating more resilient and stable health systems following on from COVID? 
So COVID has obviously demonstrated the need for universal, well-equipped health systems that can treat everyone when needed, that incorporate uh, public health and surveillance, uh, have strong governance and regulation, and are really able to cope with surges in demand that you might get, for example, in a pandemic. And the bottom line for all of this is really uh, that we need increased public financing for health. So we need governments to spend more on health. And this is the guaranteed way to achieve universal health coverage too. Um, but contrary to what we might expect on a more optimistic note, uh, crises have often previously been the trigger for increased public health spending. So for example, Sri Lanka started expanding its free healthcare uh, into rural areas in the 1930s. And that was in response to a number of devastating malaria epidemics. The UK introduced its free healthcare and the National Health Service uh, after World War II in the major welfare reforms which followed that. Um, you've got a similar story in China launching healthcare reforms uh, following the SARS epidemic in 2003. And countries across the world that have good, strong universal health systems, so France, Japan, Thailand, they often emerge from some sort of period of crisis or fragility uh, in, in the state. And so we're seeing a few countries exploring expanding their healthcare today as well. So while there is this serious risk that COVID, uh, you know, governments are facing debt crises and rising inflation, and they've spent a lot of public money on COVID, there is a real risk that they might just tighten their belts on health spending. But there is also this much more uh, valuable possibility that they seize this moment when health is at the top of the political agenda to really strengthen their health systems and achieve universal health coverage. Um, and I just wanted to touch on one final issue in my last minute or two, if that's OK. Um, and that's really what COVID has revealed about global health as well, um, and particularly around issues of vaccine inequity. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with what's happened on the global vaccine rollout. Um, but just to recap, while high income countries at the minute average around, well, almost two doses for every person, only uh, just around 10% of people in low income countries have received a first dose at all. Um, and what we've really seen there is some high, high income countries behave really, really badly on this. So, uh, there was a lot of behaviours along the lines of buying up the vaccine supply as it became available. So the vaccines were development, they went uh, were developed, they went into production, and high income countries were negotiating deals to buy up that supply as it was generated. Whilst they also simultaneously failed to sufficiently support or even blocked initiatives which might have increased the overall supply of vaccines for the world. Um, and that includes things that some of you may be familiar with, such as the proposal at the World Trade Organization to waive intellectual property rights on vaccines for the duration of the pandemic. Um, then we saw that the, the main global health initiative to supply vaccines, which is called COVAX, uh, which was supported by a lot of the high income countries as donors, uh, it was very slow to get going on its rollout, it relied on one supplier initially, um, which was a, a major error when that supplier was unable to uh, export vaccines anymore. Um, it was the way it was organized was really shaped by high income countries again, so it, it privileged the, the needs of the high income countries. Um, and it really sustained the current approaches on vaccine production, which don't uh, expand that overall production pie uh, that the world has. Uh, uh, for developing and, and getting vaccines uh, produced. Um, so that initiative has now delivered over a billion vaccines, but originally aimed to have delivered double that by now. And it's currently facing a huge funding shortfall, um, $5 billion on vaccines for this year and $16 billion in total. So I really just wanted to flag that because I think, as well as those uh, national reflections on health systems, it's important to think about um, what COVID has revealed about global health um, and reflect on 
that this has really been a moment where global health failed catastrophically. Um, and you saw kind of high, in, high income country nationalism really overtake and erode multilateralism and those mechanisms uh, that we've uh, been used to relying on before this. Uh, and yeah, I'll stop there for now. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Miss Charisma. If I can ask you to take the floor now. Yep. Thank you. Muted. Mute yourself. Thank you, Max. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Uh, I'm happy to be here and speak for this session, and I will be looking into the global health security angle. So basically, COVID-19 is a disease that has been evolving over the last two years, and it continues to be a reason that we have to worry about. Uh, but the thing is that this is not the first pandemic that has affected uh, us globally. We've had outbreaks before, which has affected health systems, uh, and uh, there have been measures that have been taken. Uh, to respond to these outbreaks. But these measures have not been uh, effective enough to build a resilient public health system. Uh, so when uh, we're talking about the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, one thing that we have to see, the most important thing about this pandemic is that it has affected health systems across the globe, uh, irrespective of how robust they were. So now today what I'm talking about is about the global health uh, security. And where, before I go forward to this, I would like to define what global health security is. It is the existence of strong and resilient public health systems that can prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease threats wherever they occur in the world. So we have uh, uh, an agenda like this. We have um, we have measures that have been taken uh, for to achieve global health security. But still we seem to be uh, missing out on things. So I just want to go back in history and uh, give a little intro on what has been, what was happening in the past and what have we been going through. Uh, so uh, previously to improve health systemic uh, requirements, uh, in 1969, we had something called the International Health Regulations Framework that was adopted by the World Health Assembly. And this in 1969 was mainly used for strengthening uh, the disease detection in countries at a national level and focus on a few specific diseases alone. But over time, uh, the compliance to this, uh, these regulations reduced because uh, the, now the countries as, as a nation saw very little benefit from reporting these diseases. Now, when in 2003, the SARS virus outbreak happened, there were a lot of efforts that were taken internationally so as to coordinate and bring an international uh, and contain this uh, international outbreak. And when this happened, that is when everybody realized that they need to revise the international health regulation. And uh, it was uh, revised again in 2005 so as to include any event that could con constitute a public health emergency of international concern. So basically, international health regulation is a legally binding instrument of independent law uh, that aims at an international collaboration so as to prevent, protect, control, and provide a public health response to any international uh, spread of disease. Uh, this framework, it basically consists of multiple components like legislation, coordination, uh, surveillance, uh, having a national health emergency framework in place, identifying zoonotic events and, and identifying uh, events at the human-animal interface. And there was a lot of emphasis uh, on this, uh, on the revised form for uh, increasing global communications and cooperation for early detection of uh, public health em emergencies. Now, because this was, uh, uh, this was adopted by the World Health uh, Assembly, it was mandatory for all WHO member states to follow uh, this law. And uh, the WHO also got a chance to independently collect surveillance data on potential public health emergencies of uh, in international importance. Uh, they did this in two ways. Uh, one is they had the international health regulation framework, which advocated capacities that each country had to develop. Uh, and another thing is that they developed national focal points of the WHO in each of the member states so that they could respond to outbreaks as soon as possible. Now, what stopped them? What were the challenges that the uh, international health regulations were having? 
one thing uh, in 2019, when they looked into the capacities of uh, the member states in how they had developed uh, themselves to respond to, a, uh, to an outbreak, they identified that only 63% of the countries in 2019 actually had the capacity uh, which were listed as per the international health uh, regulation framework. And most of the uh, scores were higher for countries in Europe and much lower for the African region. Another important thing that they identified was the international health regulation was more of implemented at the national level. Uh, we know many of the countries uh, all over the world, uh, they have the local and the state level, which is taking care of the health uh, requirements. And they have the competencies to look into the surveillance of uh, diseases and detect diseases and report diseases. So what was happening was while the international health regulation was happening at the national level, was implementing at the national level, it was not reaching all the way to the lower uh, uh, and the, lo uh, the local level. So uh, this led and there wasn't enough of collaborations and coordinations among the, uh, the local context and the national context so that there was early disease detection. Another thing uh, were the national focal points that were uh, kept in each member state. Uh, a survey was conducted in 2019 just to identify uh, how they were able, were they able to uh, respond and uh, detect outbreaks as, as they were supposed to. And uh, something that came out from that was uh, one thing because of the intersectoral collaborations that were required often outside the health sector, uh, people at uh, the, the national focal points were not able to respond as early as possible to outbreaks whenever they had the information of that. Second thing, uh, often they did not receive the authority from decision, decision makers uh, so as to go ahead and notify an, uh, an event of importance because uh, the government felt that it would be a damage to the party or their tourism or their trade. Uh, another thing that we that was identified was, though these national focal points were uh, were uh, placed in these places, they did not have the required tools and resources that would help them in reporting. And in some contexts, even when they did report the uh, uh, event, they did not receive the adequate support they required so as to go ahead uh, with the required protocols. Uh, which is necessary when an outbreak happens. So fast forward to 2014, uh, when the Ebola outbreak uh, occurred, the global health uh, security agenda came into place and there was more efforts to see uh, and evaluate uh, the, the country capacity to deal with infectious disease outbreaks. And for this, the Global Health Security Index was uh, developed. Uh, now, the Global Health Security in, uh, Index looks into specific core elements like the prevention, detection, and response to outbreak, how the health system is, what is the compliance with the norms and the risk of infectious disease outbreaks. In 2021, a, a survey which was done by the Global Health Security Index following the COVID-19 uh, pandemic identified that though all the countries had quickly responded to a COVID-19 outbreak, no country was fully prepared for any future pandemics. So uh, what we, uh, in addition, what they also identified that was that most countries had not allocated funds to improve their capacity to address epidemic threats. Uh, there were only 25% of countries who were looking into addressing their staffing shortages. Uh, there were very low uh, public confidence uh, in the government uh, for responding uh, to outbreaks. And this is a, a negative thing considering the fact that trust in government decisions is one of the most critical factors for achieving success in COVID-19 response. Uh, in addition, uh, the Global Health Security reported that uh, there was low, lower consideration for vulnerable communities, poor risk communication strategies. And in many countries, they had not developed an agenda for responding to a national public health uh, emergency. So currently, COVID-19 has uh, affected 417 million people and attributed to 5 million deaths. Uh, the disease that began as a spillover from wet market is still lacking research on what is the mechanism of the spillover. 
uh, following the COVID uh, pandemic, we've had rapid lock, lo lockdowns uh, with countries like India, China, Spain, and Italy having the longest ones. And uh, certain countries like Sweden, South Korea, and Taiwan, who have not taken the lockdown mechanism, but rather mm -hmm. use specific strategies so as to uh, mitigate the, uh, the consequences of the uh, disaster. In addition to what the, uh, the pandemic caused, what the, uh, the health consequences of the pandemic, it, it also led to a disruption in the essential uh, service delivery, especially in about 50% of the countries, there was a disruption in services related to primary care, community care, rehabilitative care, palliative care, and even emergency services. So this has been the effect of the COVID-19 on the health services. Now, what do we need to do further? Uh, as I've already uh, mentioned, the most important thing is that we, re we really need to have to relook into the funding of uh, the health security at all levels, not just at the national level, but also at the local, national, regional, and global levels. Because one thing we've understood from COVID-19 uh, is that this is not a disease that was limited to one border. It crossed borders, it affected multiple people. And if we need to improve the, uh, uh, the public health system, and if we want to make it more stronger, we would require funding at all levels. Now, how could we go about this? Uh, so some of the examples that have been cited include uh, probably uh, investments from private uh, funding, having pu public-private partnerships and task forces that specifically identify those countries who require your funding and uh, support them, not only at the national level, but also at the local level. Another important thing is uh, strengthening the workforce, uh, improving the surveillance and the capacity building, not just at the national level, but also at the local level. Uh, one very important part of the uh, COVID-19 res response is the politics uh, that, are, that we have been seeing uh, playing uh, in the implementation of uh, various uh, recommendations and, and in the response to COVID-19. Uh, the most important uh, being, for example, uh, in the initial part of uh, the pandemic, uh, there was a delay in establishing that the pandemic was a public health, the COVID, that COVID-19 was a public uh, health emergency of importance. So uh, because of that, uh, countries like the US and many other countries displayed uh, their distrust to the, towards WHO for this delay and also went on with follow -up, following up decisions like uh, stopping the funding to the organization. But this uh, initiative that was taken plays a very, uh, play, uh, puts the organization at a difficult position because this affects not only uh, the organization, but also its response and its support in helping other countries in responding to the outbreak. Um, not only that, the politics has also uh, affected how the government responded uh, to uh, the concerns of the public. For a very long time, countries like Brazil uh, especially did not even uh, accept that uh, there were consequences for the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, but compared to that, there have also been countries that have uh, looked beyond their borders and supported each other uh, in, in responding to the COVID-19 outbreak. For example, I would say it would be South Africa, uh, that had excelled in their clear communication and a strategic use uh, of their uh, system so as to empower people to understand the risk and help the government make uh, transparent and balanced decisions about how a closure or lockdown should happen. Uh, German leaders like the Chancellor Angela Merkel happened to talk, uh, call out to the citizens and she specifically uh, mentioned three essential aspects of uh, the pandemic response, which specifically were patience, discipline, and solidarity. So uh, a lot of, so from there, we see that there are a lot of examples where politics has played both a beneficial role as well as a deteriorating role in uh, the response to uh, COVID-19. And in the future, what we need is that if a scientific recommendations need to be put into place, 
they require the help of uh, the the political institution and the political leader leaders and stakeholders so that we can get take a collective responsibility of the outbreak and ensure that scientific recommendations are put in place apart from that we've also identified that uh, vulnerable communities uh, were affected during this uh, pandemic uh, now certain countries like it is very uh, commendable to identify that certain countries like colombia went out of their way to protect uh, Venezuelan migrants uh, by make, who weren't eligible for cash transfers by providing them shelters and food centers. So uh, a way to identify and support such uh, uh, vulnerable populations is by developing surveillance systems that specifically identify the, uh, uh, these vulnerable communities and transparently report uh, the disease in these communities so that proper recommendations can be taken for them. Another important effort that we need to take is also to look uh, not only into the quantitative aspects of the, uh, the COVID-19 outbreak that happened, but also into the social and ecological aspects as to what was responsible for the out outbreak and what are the uh, efforts that needs to be uh, taken so as to prevent such outbreaks and uh, spillovers to happen in the future. Uh, and with sorry, that, I'd sure. like to conclude yes. my- oh, sorry. Yeah. I wanted to just um, be mindful of the time and, and if we can maybe wrap up so that we can take some time for questions, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank so you. with that, I'm concluding uh, my uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much and sorry for barging in, but I know we have at least two, uh, one question that's already um, been shared and Katarina asked to, to, for it to be shared uh, by us. So um, it's a question to Jessica about ro vaccine rollout in inequality or inequity. And it's a question about whether there are any high income countries that manage to do the right thing, so not forward vaccine doses and contribute a fair amount to COVAX. Comments um, on Katarina, but yeah, that's the big question. So, Jessica? Sure. Um, it's a tricky question. I think countries, there's no example that jumps out at me of a country that's done brilliantly across the board. Uh, some countries have done better than others um, on different elements of the kind of vaccine inequity problem, I would say. So, um, I mean, the whole thing has been, has been quite bizarre, really. So if you think you've got a uh, COVAX, which is about kind of, which is the main kind of mechanism for getting doses to countries set up by uh, traditional donors and the kind of global health agencies. And there are definitely countries that have done well in terms of financially supporting that and, and sharing doses through uh, COVAX, or there are countries that have done better than others. Um, there are Then there's the kind of pillar that's about technology transfer. Um, so this is the problem of the COVAX model has always been that it doesn't expand the overall production of vaccines in the world. Um, so, you know, we develop these new vaccines. I mean, obviously, I'm trying to think time wise now, about 18 months ago. <laughs> um, and they came on stream, only a couple of comp companies knew how to make them. How do we, t they only have a certain number of capacities, but uh, uh, in terms of factories. But we know that we've got to vaccinate basically the whole world two or three times over. Um, so how do we then scale up that production? So the trouble with COVAX was that it kept things following that traditional model. It said, let's just rely on these companies that have developed the vaccines um, to work out how they're going to scale up production, maybe make some partnerships with some factories here, there, uh, and in, in a few other countries or with other companies. Um, but what it didn't do was change the structures of the system uh, that would mean you could expand that production further. So it, uh, and then, uh, so it didn't kind of for a long time invest in transferring that technology to low and middle income countries, for example. And there's been this consistent issue around intellectual property rights on the vaccines. Um, and uh, blocking the proposal that's supported by well over 100 countries at the World Trade Organization that intellectual property rights are waived on the vaccine 
well, as long as uh, the pandemic phase of COVID is ongoing. Um, and so, yeah, so you can take any sort of high income country and say, OK, they've done OK on, um, you know, supporting COVAX. They might have given it lots of money, um, but then they've blocked the TRIPS waiver or they have. So a country like the UK, I guess, has given lots of money to COVAX um, and doses. But at the same time, you know, it bought a ridiculous number of doses originally, binned loads because they didn't use them in time, um, and blocks the TRIPS waiver. So it, it bought up, if the pie is this big, high income countries in that first six, seven months bought up the bulk of the pie and said to other countries, and you can't expand that pie. So that's really where I can't think of an example of a high income country that has done well across the board, um, but some have done better on different bits of that. The US is interesting because it supported the IP waiver, um, intellectual property waiver, sorry, uh, but it hasn't done much to kind of make that a reality. Um, and basically people, uh, there's a lot of, there's a sense that they're quite happy with that not being a reality essentially and that they they could make that happen if they wanted to um and the, the further dimension maybe just to flag at this point is that a lot of those original vaccines that we had moderna pfizer biontech and astrazeneca were funded kind of in huge uh, proportions by taxpayers in countries like the uk uh, and the us um and so uh, to an extent, the US government, for example, owns a portion of the technology for the Moderna vaccine. So it could force the sharing of that if it wanted to and hasn't done that. So it's a very complicated picture. I'm hoping I'm giving you a flavour of that um, now. But yeah, I can't think of a country that's done really well kind of across the board. OK, well, thank you very much for that. And uh, yeah, not the most optimistic answer there, but uh, <laughs> it is what it is. Thanks, Jessica. We have Ayan with another question, I guess. You want to mute yourself, Ayan? Yeah, sure. Um, I was wondering about China's approach to COVID. Of course, they had massive um, numbers in the beginning, but you could argue that over time, especially in the recent years, um, uh, sorry, recent months, they have sort of been able to contain the pandemic to some extent. Um, so what are the takeaways from China we can take from for sort of the European countries, for example, or are there any takeaways at all? Great. And we, you can maybe address it to both of our speakers. So Karishma, Jessica, if you want to. Just um, um, anyone really, just an answer would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, any of our speakers? Yeah. yeah? Yeah, thank you. Ian. So one thing about China is that there were, uh, in the initial part of the uh, pandemic, one thing is that they did, they were a little delayed in reporting, uh, in the early reporting of the outbreak, but one, but they were very fast in their response also. Uh, and that's the very same, uh, they brought their travel restrictions, they brought the military support, uh, they have been having a very good system of uh, uh, detection and surveillance, and uh, and they had a very good coordinated response to the uh, outbreak. Uh, further on, even when there have been uh, recent uh, uh, spikes in the uh, in the pandemic, then they have been very fast in bringing travel restrictions. So it completely, so uh, again, uh, early detection, response, and collaboration are the main things that I believe is what worked for China also uh, in seeing that they could contain the uh, outbreak. Um, just a follow-up question on that then. Um, would you attribute these um, positive um, controlling methods upon the government itself? So they have maybe have more control compared to the European governments, for example, where it's more democratic in a sense, um, would that be a possible way to look at it? Or would you not attribute that specific um, association? 
sort of the control of like locking down, restricting travel to uh, the government style of China, so the one party government style. Yeah, so there I would also like to uh, bring out the fact that, uh, again, politics plays a huge role in the uh, recommendations that were implemented in each country. For example, we've already seen that uh, in the initial stages, some of the European countries happen to not do have any lockdown. For example, Sweden did not have a lockdown at all. Uh, and uh, they specifically worked into uh, social distancing. And there were other, uh, there were other uh, apart from the European countries, you can look at South Korea also. South Korea had specific strategies so as to see that uh, the outbreak was contained. So I, it completed the implementation of recommendations uh, and seeing that they were evidence-based and scientific were completely dependent to a large extent to the politics in that, uh, in that country. So yes, the politics did have a huge role in, uh, for example, if you look in uh, certain countries, like even in India, if you look, we had a very long uh, stringent lockdown that happened, uh, which could, which was not required to a certain extent. It had its own effects. It had its economic effects. It had its, um, people lost jobs, food, there was food insecurity, there were issues like that. So. Uh, when you compare the way each country has responded, there could have been a much, much more effective and scientific uh, manner of doing so. And that was definitely dependent on the uh, governing body. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, just to, uh, again, being mindful of time, we have uh, three questions. We have Lisa, Max, and then Chiara. And uh, I will then maybe ask one of our I guess, speakers to, to respond to each. So I think we can, we can maybe hear the questions first and then depending on the, uh, the profile. And um, then, okay, we have Kiria then and we'll, we'll have to close the list of questions on that. So we have four questions, Lisa, Max, Kiara, Kiria. Let's take them one by one. So Lisa. Um, I actually was going to pick up on Krishna's point about the sort of political actors and their influence on delaying uh, scientific measures, even though we sort of had those, the scientific advice there, it, it ne wasn't necessarily followed immediately because political actors prioritized their own, you know, personal careers potentially over what was best for international public health security. I wondered what can we actually do in terms of public health security to sort of implement stringent, potentially even like legally binding uh, measures to ensure governments follow the scientific advice while also allowing for that freedom of governance. Yeah, so uh, in answer to that, actually the International Health Regulations Framework is a legally binding instrument. Uh, and the problem with, with that is the implementation. Uh, so, uh, Sadly, as I mentioned in 2019, only 60% of uh, capacities were fulfilled as per the International Health Regulations Framework. So what we need to do is that we need uh, a collective action towards it. Like we need to be able to tell or make the, uh, and to a, there's a certain level of ethics also that's involved. The country has to take the responsibility of not only uh, implementing uh, the IHR in the correct manner because it protects not only the country but also its bordering countries. So this is a kind of uh, collective thought process that has to be brought and to a, a, to a great extent I think the flaw was in the implementation of the, uh, uh, in the, of the IHR. I think more efforts needs to be seen that that is stringently implemented in every country. And if there is, there is a problem in implementation of uh, because of the lack of resources, that's where partnerships, public-private partnerships, high-income countries supporting, high-middle-income countries can support in funding, uh, these, funding the capacity building of these countries. Because finally, if an outbreak happens there, there's a lot of international trade, there's a lot of mobility, it'll be coming into the other countries. So that's the kind of attitude I believe that should be taken. Thank you. 
Thanks a lot. We have Max with another question. All right, thank you. So mine is just fact checking, um, especially on the response to this pandemic health crisis. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm uh, particularly doing the fact checking on the vaccination. And uh, so um, as countries are getting now, as a new, again, a new era, um, there is, uh, I, I feel like there's some information I'm missing. I need to fill the gap. Like uh, the, the, the producers or the manufacturers of the vaccines give recommendations on which dates you can take the booster. Say for example, Pfizer, which I took recommends five months. However, some countries uh, are now taking a different route that uh, for example, France is now taking a new route that after three months you can boost uh, so I wanted to understand that um, what are the consequences of boosting yourself before the recommended um, month from uh, the manufacturer? And I mean, where did it start in the first place? That uh, what is the minimum you can take to take the booster? And I mean, where did the five months, six months uh, countries approach are taking originate from? Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Matt. Our response from... My speaker is Jessica, you're on mute. Do you, uh, should I? Sure. Jessica? Yeah? Yeah. Are, are you taking that? No, you go ahead if you, unless you want okay. me to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now, in answer for that, I would say, so the first thing that we need to understand about uh, the vaccines here is that we have developed vaccines, the vaccines have been developed in the last 18 months. So, uh, so, there is a lot of research that goes into uh, what is a, a maximum time period of effectiveness and what is the best time for taking uh, the vaccine before so as to get a, a response which boosts your current uh, immune response. Um, and I would like to also bring the fact is that the last time a vaccine was uh, brought in so soon was, I think, the measles vaccine, which was in four years. So there's a lot of uh, scientific literature behind uh, scientific work and scientific literature uh, that is still developing about the vaccine. So uh, even in India, uh, there was a time when uh, COVID shield was uh, given after four weeks, and then that uh, increased to uh, six weeks, and then it, it has increased further. But that completely depends on the information that they are receiving from the uh, the patient data, the uh, the research trials that are happening. And hopefully, and, and that is one of the reasons why in some places you find that it is four months, and in some places you find six months. And hopefully we would probably come into a stage where we will identify what would be the correct time period where we would require uh, the, the dose and we will have a much more uniform dosage mechanism. Uh, but that's all that I have to share, just if you want to add. Okay, thank you. And maybe then I'll ask Chiara to ask her question and then Kiria to ask his and then we will, we will we'll take uh, the answers. Okay, so we have two questions and then last round of replies. Chiara? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much. I'll try to be brief. So I have another question for uh, Mrs. Krupp. So you talked about when, when kind of talking about the, the problems with, um, with crisis management in general, you talked about this mismatch between kind of national level regulation and, 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 and rules, and then the actual implementation of, of those, um, of that management at the local level. And I, yeah, I definitely saw it in, in my country, in, in Italy, which, um, yeah, as a problem. Um, I was wondering whether you could expand maybe upon that, like whether you have some solutions. Like I think in Italy, at least the kind of, declaring a state of emergency was maybe a way to kind of get around that. So maybe, you know, increasing like the, the central government's uh, kind of reach even in, in local area through kind of the justification of, of, of an emergency. But obviously that also raises issues related to kind of liberty and, you know, democracy in general. So I was, yeah, I just um, wondered what you thought about that. 
Um, so yeah, like uh, many programs, there's, uh, there's a lot of a vertical approach uh, when there's an implementation at the national level. Sometimes it does not reach all the way to the uh, local level. Now, one thing that we could do is to strengthen the local uh, environment with, uh, the, with the capacity, first with the capacity and the resources that they need. So that will allow them in uh, ensuring that the disease surveillance happens in the correct manner. So many a times what happens is that um, the information that reaches uh, the national level is uh, fragmented and they do not get a good idea of the of the of the what is what they need uh, that needs to be shared with the WHO or uh, which will probably give them an information as to do I have an outbreak that's happening? Is, is, am I seeing any disease trends that I should be worried about? So for that, for them to understand, like even if I was to speak about uh, India, now the problem is that there's a lot of uh, staff shortages at the local level. Um, the, the number of uh, health workers for uh, the, the population is low and that many resources are not uh, invested into the into improving this so there has to be efforts that are taken so as to build the uh, health resources uh, the human uh, workforce at the local level and if that can be done and if they can be trained uh, well to identify diseases and properly uh, provide uh, information regarding the diseases notify the authorities in time i'm sure that along with a collaborated response with each state could ensure that information reaches the national level at the right time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. I see that, uh, well, I'm curious, sorry, you, you're coming next, but just to know, note that we have another question, so we might actually give more time to Q&A. Thank you very much to our, to our guest speakers. If you can bear with us for another couple of minutes, but we see that we have a very curious audience. And uh, My question is a very short one. Um, I know that um, we've been seeing campaigns about vaccine equity in um, in different um, regions of the world, especially in Africa. And, um, you know, when it comes to vaccination, just um, less than 30% of some, you know, the population in some African countries are vaccinated. And so we're talking about, um, you know, these vaccine enrollment strategies. So uh, I see a lot of campaigns coming up about, um, a lot of actions coming up about vaccine enrollment and um, some really violating like human rights. Some people saying, oh, if you're not getting vaccinated, um, you will not be allowed to take a, take up a job or probably take up some opportunities and stuff like that. So I really want to ask Karishma, what, what do you think we can do when it comes to, um, you know, create, having a kind of um, strategy that could really help to promote vaccine enrollment and, um, you know, and that would not necessarily violate human rights. Yeah, something like that. Right. Thank you very much. Any of our speakers want to take that? I think it was addressed to you, Karishma. Me? So, yeah. yeah. If you want okay. to start, um, I have a few yeah. kind of general points I can chip in. Sure. So maybe sure. Karishma and then so I think, from you. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I, yeah, I so um, now one thing I think about uh, uh, about uh, here, the, the issue here is that uh, people feel that their uh, rights are getting violated when they are forced to take vaccinations to uh, go for a job or go for uh, Now, the, here I think the problem is in the discommunication. So probably uh, if we could identify what, uh, why uh, has the information been properly given to the audience? Have they, been, have they been told why you need to take the vaccine? How does it help them? And, uh, in the, and the fact that this is again a collective responsibility when you're protecting uh, yourself, you're protecting also uh, the rest of your community, it, uh, that sort of an information, more transparent information will probably help uh, people in accepting vaccinations and they would not feel that this was uh, a violation. But I think there is more in, uh, and not only that, we need to have identify relevant stakeholders and relevant people in the community with whom we can have this discussion, uh, sit down and have a talk about it and then uh, and then identify ways in which we can uh, go ahead with the recommendation. Yeah, that's from my end. Great, thank you. Uh, Jess, do you Jess want to come in now? Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I just, um, from listening to the last few questions, I just had a few kind of random points to chip in on a few of them. 
Uh, first was just on the lessons from China. Um, one thing it's worth flagging is that on the vaccine front, um, so the provision of the Chinese vaccine, Sinopharm, um, has been much greater than the provision of vaccines through COVAX um, to uh, low and middle income countries. So, you know, there's there's certainly a less some lesson there to be drawn about what has worked in terms of getting the vaccine out um, to low and middle income countries. Um, on the question uh, that we've just had on kind of vaccine hesitancy, um, I was just going to say that that is a problem everywhere. Um, you know, there are populations absolutely everywhere in the UK where I am now. Um, I think there's something like five or six million adults that are still unvaccinated despite having, you know, uh, vaccine centres on every high street um, where you can just walk in and get it done for free. Um, so that is a problem everywhere, and I, I, I would just flag that um, uh, it has sometimes been used as an argument to say um, against some of these more structural issues about um, how the vaccine has been produced around kind of intellectual property and sharing the technology. Um, you sometimes hear people say, oh, but people don't want to take it in that country, so why would we solve these problems? Um, and it's just important to challenge that because hesitancy is a problem absolutely everywhere. Um, and we know that we have these problems on, on the global production of the vaccine too. And you can't be hesitant about a vaccine uh, if you can't get access to it. Um, so access has to be, it has to be kind of the first step there. Um, yeah, and, and I just wanted to come back to re-emphasize really what Karishma said, that a lot of this all boils down to public spending on health, to governments actually um, investing sufficient money in health systems, in regulation, in implementing um, the international health regulations, as, as Karishma has said, um, in rolling out the vaccine, in testing, uh, whatever it may be, a lot of it boils down to public spending on health. And, and there's a real necessity to kind of keep up that um, pressure and momentum on that um, and not allow governments to sort of retreat into uh, austerity or cutbacks. Right. Th thanks. Thanks for that. And thank you for your uh, never ending patience. I hope you can hang around for another couple of minutes. We have one last question. That, that's okay. Yeah. Kiria, can you try now? Maybe without the video, it will be easier. Okay. Uh, I happen to use my country as a case study. That is Uganda. And uh, first and foremost, I want to thank those ones that, those countries that really came up and donated uh, vaccines during that hard time to Uganda. That I have to appreciate. But now here comes uh, uh, an issue where there is a, a misconception uh, when it comes to uh, drugs, to, to these uh, vaccines. I happen to work in a rural setting, and you find that someone who had uh, an AstraZeneca vaccine two months back. And this person is expected to get a, a second dose. It goes to a, a LFA center and finds out that there is no AstraZeneca even within the country, but uh, probably Pfizer is there. And the same LFA, LFA workers uh, advise this person that, you know, for the second dose you can take Pfizer for Astra, for AstraZeneca uh, second dose. Now, yeah, this is becoming a big problem that most of uh, our people would want so much to go for these vaccines. But after getting such a, a misconception, you find that this person won't go totally to, to get a vaccine, you know? Actually, this would be a big question to the director of uh, World Health Organization that our people are not sensitized on, on, on which Vaccine is, is, is best for which time? I'm trying to give you reality. This is something that is happening down there. So I, I, I really want to, uh, to, to know how we can really address this kind of issue because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's there and people are illiterate completely. Thank you so much. Okay, just to make sure that we got that. So we have a question about the information and maybe misinformation and also a question about how to 
tailored it, it, message and recommendations for specific vaccines for specific groups? Surely, 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 because there is a misconception. Yes. Thank you, Max. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jess, Karishma, do you want to take that? Uh, sure, if I can start and then Karishma, if you want to chip in. Um, and just to say, you know, I'm not I'm not a clinician, so <laughs> I just want to make that very clear. Um, but um, I, I guess I, the main thing that I, I would reflect on that is what Karishma has already said about the importance of communications um, in different local national contexts and really tailoring them uh, to whatever the context is and being as specific as possible around that in terms of communicating what are the right vaccines to have at the right times. Um, but I do think that's been a real challenge because the pandemic itself has continually evolved, as we know, we get a new variant every few months and, uh, and then governments are fundamentally sort of chasing to react to um, both the changes in the pandemic and also the changes in the evidence um, around the vaccine. So um, I can I can think back to a time in the UK where um, yeah, mixing and matching of vaccine doses was seen as very bad, but now it's seen as absolutely normal. Um, and that's because in that time period, the evidence has shown that actually it can even be beneficial and, and give a, a stronger um, immune response if you if your boosters are of another type. Um, but I, yeah, but I think it is a real challenge and really uh, communications um, it is the only way through it, really. Yeah, Karishma, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I, I, I second you, uh, what you said, uh, Jess. The, the main thing about uh, the COVID, the main thing about uh, the COVID pandemic is there's been a lot of misconceptions, a lot of information that uh, have not been transparently given. Um, and this is a disease that has been evolving again. So uh, as Jess has already mentioned, first, uh, there was the belief that we had to get the doses of one single uh, type of uh, a vaccine. But now evidence has come that even if you take the first dose of one vaccine and the second dose of the other vaccine, maybe your immunity is much better. But whatever the uh, point is, uh, I still feel that when you're uh, when when a health worker explains this or says this to one client, one person, uh, it if it's not taken in the that that's not the right way to communicate this information. Rather, uh, this information should be correctly informed to that population of the people as to what the government is trying to do. Is uh, why is the government uh, is the government dictating or is this? is this uh, an information which has been given from by one person so again uh, ensuring that the communication is transparent and you inform your community would be the only way in which you can see that a recommendation happens or not that's all that i would like to add thank you that's great so thank you so much i'll have to stop the, the questions um, here and i'll start maybe by thanking our speakers we, we ask you to be patient enough with us and stay with us to, until quarter to, to six it is now 10 past so thank you very much for taking all the questions and, and great contributions in your initial um statements and then also in answering the questions um thank you very much for for your time and also i would like to extend Thanks to those of you who participated in the online discussion. I failed to mention this uh, at the start of our, of our event, but we've actually we've had the liveliest uh, online discussion on the platform so far, I think, with over 100 entries with ideas and questions and challenges. So it's really great to see all of you so active on the platform. And maybe to, to complement what's been happening yeah, throughout the event today, you seem to have a lot of, uh, a lot of questions uh, we, and we probably didn't have time uh, despite the generosity of our guest speakers and, and, and altering the time frame of this event to cover all of them. So please take your questions back to the platform, leave them there. Uh, we have uh, f further events uh, coming up and we'll, we'll try to find ways of, um, of answering those and also to keep the discussion alive on the platform is also very precious. Uh, to all of us and opens the platform up to, to a discussion up to, to other members of the group. So uh, again, sorry for a slight change of format. We will not have time for breakout uh, this time around. <laughs> but if I encourage everybody to go back to the platform to, for any follow-up discussion on what was discussed here, 
and then uh, register for the March 2 event, just to, to, to remind you that the March 2 event is focused on the socio-economic aspects of, um, of the pandemic, and we're going to have a formidable selection of speakers from Chatham House, from uh, ODI, and they'll look at the disproportionate impact and implications of that of the pandemic on education, global food systems, and the political economy in, in Africa and elsewhere. And we've already had fascinating discussions on that on the platform. So if, if those things are of interest to you, please register for the 2nd of March event and join us then. Okay, and then bear in mind that at the end of March, we will have a, a policymaker event. So, so there will also be space on the platform for you to generate ideas and solutions. We've heard quite a lot of, uh, uh, how do I put it, maybe not uh, the most optimistic news and takes on what the countries have done and governments and policymakers. So let's hope that we can we can also address some of those issues in the in the idea generating uh, part of our of our challenge. So I'll just draw on the sort of best uh, elements of my Polish and British identity. I will um, I will complain a little bit. So yeah, you, you have a lot of questions and we have to change the format. So apologies. Uh, for for altering it a little bit and sorry for not giving you the time uh, to ask um, everything and to to work in in smaller groups let's hope we're going to have this time on the 2nd of march so thank you for your contributions and uh, i'll see you on the 2nd of march and on the platform <laughs>